us and which is actually one of the most extraordinary uh, experience that in my career. And I actually worked on flu and the SARS came in 2003 in Hong Kong, then I was caught and then had to work on this particular disease. Right, now um, I'm going to split my talk into three parts. I'm going to talk about, share my history, uh, some history about SARS in Hong Kong. And also uh, the second part is how did we contain SARS? And then the third part is how, what we are, uh, where we are at the moment. Right, okay, first of all, uh, SARS, um, it was, uh, it occurred in 2003 and it was contained in July 5th uh, in 2003. And that was the time that WHO announced that uh, SARS has been contained worldwide. At the end of this period, about 8,500 people get infected and which are confirmed by diagnostic tests. And then uh, about 10% of these people, that means 800 people, was, would die because of the SARS infection. All right, and then um, country like Canada, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Taiwan, Singapore were the most affected countries. And, and it actually had a very big impact on economics. Although only 800,000 people die, but the cost, the economic impact of SARS in these four countries, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Canada, actually lost about $50 billion which is comparable to our pandemic H1N1, pandemic H1N1 in 2009, which affect around the globe, right? So actually this SARS outbreak caused a major impact to this country, both in terms of healthcare and also in terms of economics, right? And right, the whole thing actually was start in 2002, November. The first in that case, the very first in that case of SARS of was found in this particular month. It was in Fusan. At that time, there was a patient actually caused a hospital outbreak in this part of country, uh, this province in, in China. And subsequently, in the following months, this disease spread to different cities of Guangdong province, like Hoyan, Guangzhou city, Jinmen and Shuzhongshan, and they actually spread to multiple cities and caused hospital outbreaks. All right, and then in February 2003, there were about 200 cases were reported from this province. Right, and actually it caused a huge social instability at that time Right, in, in February, this is the picture taken in uh, February 2003, and this is actually a convenience store selling vinegar. At that time, there was a rumor that uh, boiling vinegar can actually vaporize um, the, ra the acid and actually able to inactivate the virus. At that time, a bottle of uh, vinegar, it was originally 10 yuan, and then it became 1,000 yuan at that particular month. So actually, it caused a lot of social instability in that region. And then at that also at, at the same month, in February 2003, we found two H5 human, human, human cases in Hong Kong, which were imported from China, right? So there were a lot of rumors that maybe a pandemic H5N1 occurred in, chi in China, or maybe there's some other unknown outbreak occurred in China. But anyway, we had that in first, first attack in at the same month. In February 2003, 21st of February 2003, the index uh, case, case of Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong coming from Guangzhou to visit Hong Kong. He stayed in Hotel M and spread the disease to 16 individuals within the same hotel. And these individuals, some of these flew to China, back to China, get to USA, but some of these caused major outbreak in Vietnam, Singapore, Canada, and also in Hong Kong as well. Like the Prince of Wales Hospital cluster, this at the end caused 238 people in infection in because of that single introduction. And in Singapore, because of these individuals, it caused 200 odd cases in Singapore and the hospital settings as well. Right, what I'm saying is basically when this disease get to a hub for transportation or international transportation, it can spread to multiple countries easily. 
right? And then, um, and as I mentioned before, one of these infected individuals flew to Vietnam and then actually caused an outbreak in Hanoi. And Dr. Carol Yuvani actually reported this case and then at the end, un unfortunately, he died because of SARS uh, in Thailand, right? And but what th this time point basically hin indicated that just within a very short period of time, from 11 to 14, there were multiple outbreaks or multiple SARS cases in different countries. And on 15 of March, 2003, WHO basically issued a travel advisory and tried to discourage people to visit this affected country at that time. And it caused an uh, anomalous impact, right? And then uh, just two days after, WHO set up a network for SARS naps and a lot of countries, um, actually a lot of stuff in different countries set up a network and they, they have a regular teleconference or meeting to try to better understand the SARS and how we can contain it. Right, okay, so uh, after, few, after several weeks and three independent groups, one from Hong Kong, one from um, uh, the Europe and one from US CDC, basically independently found that there was a new virus which can be found in SARS patient. And this is a, and then that was actually a huge breakthrough because, because of that, we can develop tools for many things, like for doing laboratory diagnosis, uh, do a lot of uh, serial epidemiological studies, and also able to try to come up with some clinical management for SARS patients. And that breakthrough actually was a major breakthrough because we can now understand that this is a viral infection and we can able to do something to control it. Right, uh, in May 2003, uh, Epstein's basically from Rotterdam, um, they basically managed to actually reproduce the SARS in Macat. And basically within two months, we may manage to fulfill the cost postulate. We, we can manage to isolate the pathogens in SARS patients. We can able to reproduce the disease in an animal model, right? So that was, um, Major big blue. Right, so then how, how did we contain SARS at that time? I think there were multiple measures and I would say that these, these are very aggressive measures. Um, first of all, we use a very high long specific case definition. And at that, that time in, in March, 2003, so basically those patients who have a high fever or have a history of contact of SARS patient, they will consider to be a suspected case. And then for the portable case, they may have a chest x-ray showing pneumonia, and then without any known etiology. So these are highly long specific criteria. So basically, we, think we, are putting, we were putting a lot of people under the radar so that we can actually follow these people and monitor them in real time. And just to give you an example, this is um, a paper coming from, uh, from, from CDC. So during the SARS period, CDC basically do a surveillance and follow 200 people. And then of these people, only eight people get actually was, was positive for, Mer for SARS. So what I'm saying is actually at that time, we actually set up, set, set up the bar to very high level. And we should try to identify those suspected patients very aggressively so that we can prevent, stop the transmission chain. Right, and then the second um, measure is that is actually we have a very strict infectious disease control. And these epi curves show the epi, uh, SARS cases in Hong Kong, Singapore, and also in Guangdong, China. And then what we found was um, basically there were um, several major outbreaks in hospital settings. And so those, hi those highlighted in red. So this is basically the Prince of Wales hospital outbreak. And then this and this, this were hospital outbreak in Singapore. And those at the white bar, these are hospital acquired infection in Guangdong. So that highlight that actually these disease actually spread widely in hospital settings. If we don't actually introduce concrete control measures, that disease may continue to spread. Um, so probably, I mean, because of that, uh, because of this outbreak, and that picture actually issue a very prompt guideline uh, to try to prevent this, or try to manage this SARS patient. Like what PPE we need to wear, uh, how we should pay manage the patients, and et cetera. Those guidelines actually were very helpful. And a lot of countries actually follow this guideline to try to prevent hospital acquired infection. All right, and then also there are a lot of uh, si simple studies um, 
a practical one, um, like whether the hand hygiene is actually effective to prevent or stop transmission of SARS. So, I mean, these aggressive inf uh, infectious disease control in hospital setting uh, actually were one of the contribution to prevent SARS or stop SARS, right? And then the third measure is uh, aggressive con contact tracing and quarantine policy, right? Uh, this is the one of the data coming from Taiwan. Um, you can see that during that period of time, about 150,000 people were home quarantined or were quarantined quarantine in a hospital settings, right? It, it, this indicated how aggressive that quarantine policy was. And of, of course, in Hong Kong, we isolate about 200 people who live in one of the major outbreak sites, Amway Garden. They were sent to um, a holiday camp to be quarantined for 10 days. And flu coaster and so on and so forth. There are a lot of policies try to stop human movement, try to isolate those suspected pay case. I mean, this uh, data uh, 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 results coming from Stephen Marley. Um, what he predicted that was, the prediction was, I mean, if we can manage to stop 50% of the human movement and also 50% of the reduction in hospital transmission, we can actually try to control the SARS outbreak at that time. And if you can manage to reduce the transmission by 70%, the outbreak will die off, right? So, I mean, aggressive control measures was one of the policy to try to control SARS. And then WHO also tried to issue a travel advisory so, and stop people or uh, discourage people to visit affected countries. So this is the number of visitors which come to Hong Kong at that period of time. So right after the public uh, the travel advisory from WHO, the number of people going to coming to Hong Kong or visitors coming to Hong Kong dropped dramatically by six fold. And when Hong Kong was removed from the list, then the number of visitors go up. Right. And so that actually prevent a lot of people get into the community and get infection. And then the other thing is that that picture <coughs> tried to release this information in a very prompt manner. And within three months, four months, there was 96 update. Right. I think this is a bit unusual. I mean, I never see that before. All right. But that picture had actually released this information very aggressively so that all the countries can follow this situation and try to do, do uh, their, uh, 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 adjust their policy. And then also there were numerous press conference uh, to general publics, and then also there were several, a lot of our teleconference for expert group to try to share the data and discuss uh, how we can do it. So all in all, that actually come to this, transparency and accountability. Right, and then the other thing is actually, um, I would say we, we're a bit lucky in that time because SARS at the end is not so infectious, right? Um, this is the SARS. Basically, the R0 is about two to three, right? And then only 10% people die because of infection. So it is not as infectious as disease like measles, right? So we can manage to contain it. And then the second thing is SARS patients, not like flu patients. For flu patients, they got this, they, they develop disease, they spread the disease at the same day. But for SARS, actually, they were not so infectious. They are they were not so infectious in the first week of disease onset, right? So this is the viral load that come from patient from at the type of, um, from sample they collected from week one, week two, and week three of disease onset. And you can see that the week the peak, the viral load peaks at second week of disease onset. So in the first week, when the patients start to feel ill, have fever, and then we can actually try to able to contain them when they were at the stage that they, are, they were not so infectious, okay? So I think this make us lucky and so that the disease do not spread on. Right, and then the other um, reason we can contain it is uh, actually we can manage to find the animal source. And during that period of time, we, we know that the intact case of the SARS actually was a butcher right, in a restaurant a chef, basically a chef in a restaurant. And so that with that, at that time, we went to China and then collect samples. And what we found was, um, we found there some wild game animal in the market, like silver cat, palm silver cat, and raccoon dog. They were PCR positive for male, as for SARS, right? And then genetically, they were actually clustered very together, right? So what we believed at that time was, um, actually the SARS virus may be actually coming from wild animal, 
and then they spread to human and cross outbreaks. And that time, because of this founding, China basically banned the selling of masks to civil cats at that period of time. But the ban was relieved in, a in August 2003. And then after a few months, there were a few human cases in January 2004. And what we found was um, this virus from human actually genetically, genetically very similar to the virus found in civil cat in December 2003. So there was a strong clue to indicate that these animals, civil cats, uh, can able to harbor this virus and spread this into human. And at the end of the day, because of this, uh, China government basically banned a complete selling of palm civil cat at the time. Right. Apart from that, there were a couple of laboratory incidents um, in 2003, 2004, two in China, one in Singapore, and one in Taiwan. Um, and one lead to human to human transmission as well. So laboratory safety, again, is very important issue and we have to look at it very seriously. Right, now we contain the disease. Um, will SARS come back? Um, actually, I don't know. Uh, it may be or maybe not. It, the reason because I say that is because we actually know that this virus actually coming from, originally coming from uh, Chinese, Chinese horseshoe bat. What happened was uh, this bat virus jumped into palm silver cat and then spread the disease to human. And Jin Si from China, Wuhan, he managed, she managed to actually do a long-term systematic studies on bat coronaviruses. And what he found was last year, he found the same case in Yu Yunnan province actually have the viruses, precursor viruses of SARS. And that particular case, these three bat viruses <coughs> have genes shared to, very similar to the SARS coronavirus found in Sibet. Right, so what we believe was, um, yes, this virus, there are a lot of SARS-like virus circulating in bats. They may harbor it together, and they occasionally have recombination. And during, in 2002, these bat viruses basically generate the SARS-like coronavirus and transmitted this to animals in like civil cat. And then they cause outbreak in human. So what we know was um, these virus or SARS-like virus still circulating in bat population. They are still continue to evolve. We don't know when, we don't know why they will come to human again. But the risk is still there. Right, and then after 2003, um, we basically found that there are a lot of bat coronaviruses in, uh, in around the world, basically all in all the continent except the, 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 the North Pole, the South Pole. And this is the phylogenetic tree that, uh, that it was in 2003. This basically covered all the coronaviruses found in animals. And but look at the 2010 one. There were a lot of bat coronaviruses which highlight in red. In particular, like um, the 229E, which is a human co-virus, human co-virus, and then it actually have a sister clade of bat coronaviruses. And then, like SARS, they have a sister clade of bat coronaviruses. And not only that, like NL63, FPDV, and then um, and also other animal coronaviruses, they also have sister clade with the bat coronaviruses. So what I'm saying is, Actually, bats harbor a lot of uh, coronaviruses. They may occasionally jump into human or to other animals, like the 229E. We believe that that was a jump from bats to human thousand years ago. So the risk is there, bats, not only SARS, but also other coronaviruses, like MERS. What we believe that uh, MERS actually is, the original source of MERS is coming from bats, although we don't know the original bat species which harboring MERS at the moment. But what we know that is camel actually is the, uh, is the reservoir for human MERS. Because of this frequent contact between camels and human, they have regular spillover event to human and cause human cases. And then because of these cases, it actually cause a several hospital outbreak, like in 
South Korea, if one single introduction of MERS, 181 confirmed case was detected at the end of the day. So um, again, hospital control or infectious disease, infectious disease control is also very important to contain coronaviruses. Right, now, not only that, um, uh, these, like batch coronaviruses, does not, did not only cause problem to humans, but they could also to cause other major outbreak in animals. Like last year, there were, there was a major outbreak of coronaviruses in pigs. And that result in about 25,000 pigments die because of the infection, which only occurred in four farms in Guangdong. So imagine that if this become a pig disease, that will create a huge problem in terms of food security and also trading. And then maybe pigs become an intermediate host which can facilitate this virus to jump into human. Right, again, this virus, we found a system, I mean, uh, 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 Lin Fa Wang and then uh, Jinny, they managed to find the same virus, almost the same virus in bats in Guangdong province. Again, that reflect that there is, there was a spillover event uh, from bats to animal. Right, so that's why, I mean, that, that's why YWHO put coronavirus, I mean like MERS and SARS, as the blue pin priority disease, because we believe that these kind of coronaviruses actually pose a huge health threat to human and also other animals. And in fact, all these diseases actually highlight the concept of One Health. Right, um, because of time, I don't have the time to talk about this, but then because of SARS, actually Hong Kong learned a huge lesson. And then, bec and because of that, that, we actually revised our pandemic preparedness plan. We tried to reform our healthcare regulations and, and so on and so forth. Um, but in conclusion, that uh, what we found, what we can say is SARS was caused by a zoonotic disease. It triggered a lot of uh, aggressive measures to control it. And then um, because of that, there was a huge investment in pandemic preparedness in the af SARS aftermatch. And we know that SARS, the precursors of virus, precursor virus of SARS, coronavirus, are still circulating in bats, and they may occasionally jump into human and cause problem. And then uh, the current MERS outbreak highlights the strength and weakness of the current pandemic preparedness plan. Well, at the end, I would like to thank colleagues uh, in the WHO SARS network and those people who actually have facilitated the MERS study. Uh, with that, thank you. <laughs>